Welcome to this uh, Eucharist uh, service. First of all, can I welcome the, the Reverend Peter Giles, who has returned after a long, long time. It's about 10 years since, since we last here. So welcome back, Peter. There's a, a, couple of, a couple of notices. First of all, uh, yesterday, many of you may be aware of those of the meet, and there's a, a, lot of, a lot of activity in the church here. So thank you very much indeed for, for all volunteers, particularly Kathy Moore, who did most of the organisation. <laughs> Kathy's asked me to say there are still a number of cakes left at the back on the, t on the table near the kitchen, so please take them. And if you wish to make a donation, there is a little box there for you to put things in. But thank you very much indeed for that. In addition to that, you may, you may, have, heard, you may have noticed that we have a little bit of extra accompaniment in the service. <laughs> We've got a, a young blackbird who is flying around the rafters at the moment, so uh, apologies if there are any, uh, any events, shall we say. But, um, <laughs> And finally, uh, on the 2nd of September, there's been, uh, from 9 o'clock in the morning, there is a church clean being organised. So uh, any volunteers, if you've got a few hours to spare, a couple of hours at any time at all, we'd be really grateful that you could help them. Thank you very much. We begin our service in the of 172, a great day of praise.
Be seated for a moment. It's lovely to be with you this morning. It is indeed about 10 years since um, I was involved taking any services here. And uh, Liz and I were here for over 20 years, loosely connected with the church, but more particularly, I was working for most of those years in St. Mary's School. But it is good to be back to share worship with you. The first task I have today is some bands of marriage. Welcome if any of those whose bands I shall be reading are here in church. I published the bands of marriage between Benjamin Brunt, single of this parish with a qualifying connection with St. Luke and St. Andrew Priston, and Eleanor Shaw of this parish with a qualifying connection with that same church. These are for the third time of asking. I also published the bands of marriage between Adam Frederick Jack Macquarie of this parish and Bethany Rose of um, Alana Hill, Bethany Rose Alana Hill, also of this parish, between Mark Edward James Shepherd of the with the um, of this parish, but with a qualifying connection to St James's Chapel, and Irene Mary Tomkinson of St James's Chapel. Finally, between Jason Rowe and Lucinda Cresswell, Jason is of St Michael Ladbroke Grove with a qualifying connection with St Peter's Notting Hill, and Lucinda is of this parish with a qualifying connection with St Peter's Notting Hill. If any of you know any cause or just impediment why these persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it. Let's just pause for a moment and think of these four couples in prayer as they come to this exciting and important time in their lives. Holy Father, we pray that as each of these couples grow in their love for each other, so they may also grow in their love for you. And we pray that you would bless them as they embark on their marriage journeys together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we move today deeper into the season of Trinity, we've got to Trinity 8. Let's just pause as we meet, remembering that we are in the presence of all our mighty God, who knows us through and through. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And we meet in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and trust in his mercy. Together we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our man, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in your love to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty
mighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for the glory of Your son left the riches of heaven and became poor for our sake. When we prosper, save us from pride. When we are needy, save us from despair, that we may trust in you alone, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We sit for our readings. The first reading is taken from Kings, chapter 3, reading verses 5 to 12. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you, and you have kept for him his great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people, whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. 
For who can govern with this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring the charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. I must confess, this hymn is a new one for me, and I'm looking forward to singing it. We stand to sing our gradual hymn number 233.
gospel is written in the gospel according to St. Matthew. Lord, I see you, my Lord. Jesus put before the Christ another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it three measures of flour until all of it was left. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put and put the good in the basket that throughout the bag. So it will be at the end of the age. The end, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven. Is like a monster of a household who brings out his treasures, out of his treasures, what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of Christ. O oh God, open your word to our hungry hearts and our hearts to your word. Give us grace to receive it, to understand it, and to obey it for the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please sit down. At the beginning, of the 1960s, I was not long out of school. I moved to London and lived on my own in a basement bedsit. I enjoyed the friendship of a lovely girlfriend, but after we split up, felt lonely and alone in a big city. Just as the Good Shepherd sought out and rescued his lost sheep in the well-known Bible story, through the faithful ministry of a Christian friend, Christ sought me out and, as it were, brought me home. In my newfound faith, I discovered a new lease of life, a life full of meaning, new friends and new hope. For a new Christian, Central London provided many opportunities to seek out and listen to great teachers and preachers. For weeks on end, I was privileged to sit at the feet of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Some of you may have heard of him. For 26 years, he was minister of the Westminster Chapel near St. Paul's Cathedral. In the foreword to one of his many books, you will read these words. There is little doubt that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the greatest preacher the English-speaking world has seen in the 20th century. 
Those of us who had the privilege of hearing him will not easily forget the sense of awe which came upon one's soul as he was gripped by the glory of the gospel and God spoke with such power through him. <coughs> Yet it was not the man who lingered in the mind, nor was the lasting impression one of human gifts or intellectual ability or personal magnetism. Rather, it was the power of the truth, the greatness of God, the poverty of man, and the glorious relevance and authority of Holy Scripture, which left an indelible mark on his hearers. I must say, listening to him left me in no doubt as to the value of guided Bible study. And with him, it was Bible study in real depth. All the time I attended his talks, they were based on Romans 8, from which our New Testament reading comes. You might be surprised that my experience was restricted with him to Romans 8, but less surprised when I tell you that often he spent two or three, two or even three talks, talking about one single Bible verse. From that time, Romans 8 has been for me a special section of the Bible, a veritable treasure trove. And I'd like to share with you this morning two of the many nuggets which spring from Paul's words, and also a further thought from today's Gospel reading. First, words from verse 28 of Romans 8, words of deep comfort and reassurance to the persecuted church to which Paul was writing. Words full of meaning, encouragement, and challenge. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. These words, I believe, describe part of God's nature a nature which remains constant and are as relevant to us today as to Paul's readers. I would commend them to you as a guide as to how we can pray. When faced with difficult circumstances, it is often hard to know how to frame our prayers an example might be a situation where we are praying for someone who the medical profession tell us is going to die. Always it is right to pray that God will be with the ailing person and that they may be conscious of his loving presence. Often it is right to pray for their healing because with God nothing is impossible. Having said this, I believe we should never try to dictate to God as to how he answers our prayers. When confronted with such a situation or other difficult situations, I have been led by Paul's words to pray that God will work for good within them. There is a sense in which God can work for good without our prayers, but as one wise archbishop famously said, prayer is a very powerful thing as God has chosen to make himself dependent on our prayers. There is no situation we will ever face in which we cannot ask God to work for good. 
how God answers those prayers, we should leave to him. And I believe he often answers our prayers through our own resulting actions. Often it is not until later that we come to see how God has worked for good in answer to our prayers. Yet in faith we can always be sure that he will answer them. Paul's words challenge all of us to be men, women or children committed to prayer. Secondly, words from verse 38 of Romans 8. I am convinced, wrote Paul, that neither death nor life, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wonderful words of encouragement and comfort. It's hard, isn't it, to imagine a more confident affirmation of faith. I am certain, I am convinced, says Paul. <coughs> Yet such conviction doesn't come easily. It didn't to Paul then, and it doesn't to us now. Jesus never promised that our journey as disciples would be easy. We live in unsettling times, where witnesses to evil regimes seeking to dominate others through power, armed conflict and oppression. Covid has left many of us living in fear. Black is depicted as white. Truth has become a rare and often despised commodity. Sometimes our leaders seem strangers to the truth. We live in fear of global warming and climate change. The news is full of stories of famine, innocent suffering, large numbers of migrants seeking a better life. Every other phone call seems to be a potential scam. Yet, Paul, despite all the hardships and opposition he had to face in his new life of faith as, as a Christian, was able to confirm his unswerving faith in the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. He was able to affirm that God was still in control, however out of control the world appeared to be. And this is a faith we can share. Our faith that God is in control, despite what we see happening around us, that can become a rock on which our faith securely rests. Whenever we are discouraged, whenever we feel depressed, whenever we feel that life is getting on top of us and we can't cope, whenever the way ahead of us is not clear, we can look to Jesus and remember Paul's words. Remember, there is nothing we can ever experience in this life or in the world to come that can separate us from God's love which is forever ours through the victory Christ has won for us at great cost on the cross. Paul came to faith and famously saw the light on the road to Damascus. I suspect it was more than that one event which led to his absolute conviction of faith expressed in his letter to the Romans. The epistle to the Romans is the first one appearing in the Bible, yet it was also probably one of the last that Paul wrote, thus giving time for his conviction of faith to grow to the level expressed in Romans. Yet I'm sure that even he 
must have had moments of fear and doubt throughout his Christian journey, just as Jesus himself did towards the end of his journey in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we too will have doubts and fears, and it's good to express these to ourselves, our friends, and to God himself. Equally, like Paul, it is good for us to express our faith in the crucified and risen Lord, and to use that as a springboard to action as we work with Christ today towards the establishing of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And what might that kingdom look like? In today's gospel reading, Jesus gives us plenty of pointers. The kingdom is something that will flourish given half a chance, something to be treasured above all else, something to be worked for and is recognisable by its effects. When John the Baptist, languishing in prison, sought reassurance from Jesus that he was indeed the promised saviour who would bring in God's kingdom of righteousness and justice, Jesus points him to what was going on in the world around him. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the good news is preached to the poor. When we look at the world around us today, do we see signs of the kingdom? Not in its entirety, of course not, but we can see glimpses of it, sufficient to give us hope for the future and encourage us to continue working and praying for its establishment here on earth. The ancient Israelites were called the chosen people, not because they were God's favourites, but because they were chosen to fulfil a particular role, to be a light, to lighten the Gentiles. Likewise, God has work for us to do, to stand up for justice, to champion the poor and the weak, to feed the hungry in body and in spirit, to preach the good news in word and in deed. We are all called to be ministers of the gospel by virtue of our baptism. Very few of us are cut out to be great evangelists or intrepid explorers, but we are all cut out for something, whether that be making the tea, saving the rhino, or simply exercising a ministry of faithful prayer. It is a responsibility of each one of us as faithful followers of Christ to exercise the gifts he has given us in the service of God and of his whole creation. Amen. And so let us stand and confess our faith in this same wonderful living God. We say together, we believe in one God. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We come to our intercessions. Let us pray. and bustle of the world. Make us to be still and attentive and attentive to your presence. In the knowledge of your promise that when a few are gathered together, you will hear their call. Let us pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for your will. We thank you for the wonder and beauty of your creation. Your word. Forgive us when we destroy and mar that word through greed. We pray for areas where forests are being destroyed, the soil eroded, and water polluted. Guide us by your Spirit, all who seek to restore and renew. We pray for parts of the world affected by war or civil unrest. Strengthen in the leaders of today's world a belief in the values of justice, freedom and peace, by reason rather than force, that the nations may grow in mutual respect and understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Hear me. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Church. Lord of hosts, may your Church be attentive to the needs of strangers and visitors. May each Church be welcoming and friendly and so reflect your love. Empower all who have been called to be bishops, pastors and teachers to be good shepherds, giving them wisdom and vision in the leading of your flock. We pray for churches that are struggling because of opposition, for churches that strive to serve where there is apathy and animosity. We remember all who are persecuted for their faith. Lord Jesus Christ, Heal the dissension that divides. Draw your church together, following you into every walk of life, and together serving in your mission to the world and witnessing to your love. We pray for your church, Lord God, in this place as we await the arrival of our new rector, Castle. In September, we pray for Teresa, Emmy, Stephen, Jenny, and Aunt and Anne, visiting priests and lay worship leaders as they work to maintain normal services in this Martin Vale benefit. 
szólt én jó eset. Heavenly Father, we pray for your people. Holy Lord, we give thanks for our holy for places of peace and quiet, of leisure and recreation. We pray for all who help us here, musicians, artists, writers, broadcasters, and sports persons. We pray for our friends and loved ones. We pray for all those who have problems, for those who have lost their home through war or natural disaster, for those affected by extremes of weather caused by climate change, for those suffering increased costs due to interest rate rises and high prices for foods and other goods. We pray for all who are ill, at home or in hospital, and give thanks for doctors, nurses and carers. And we pray for those at rest in you, who have found a new life that is eternal. And in a period of silence, let us pray for those on our service ship and others personal to each one of us. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. as the beautiful June-covered rose rises from amongst its thorns. So may our hearts be so full of your love, O God, that we may rise above the storms of evil and stand fast in trust and freedom of spirit. Merciful God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, Let us stand for the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace in whatever way you now do it in your church.
we have this bread you have set before us, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine, the work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. We bless the connection. We say, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you. And of your word do we The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, whom you sent who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, ever praising you and singing. Lord of all might, help us to work together for that 
day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us to the blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So rejoice in God's presence among us. Let us pray with confidence of our Saviour and Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day in our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, for power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ.
for service, Lord, the hands that have taken holy things. May the ears that have heard your word be deaf to clamour and dispute. May the tongues that have sung your praise be free from deceit. May the eyes which have seen the tokens of your love shine with the light of heaven. And may the bodies that have been fed with your body be refreshed with the fullness of your life. Glory to you forever. Amen. We say together for prayer after communion. Almighty God, we thank you for healing us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out to the power of your Spirit to live and work with your praise and
of some 